good morning again. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to the audience online. Thank you for joining us. It's 8.30, our program will begin. I'm Chris Vincent, CEO of the Society. Today, our prominent guest speaker is Mary Ellen Stanek, Chief Investment Officer at Baird Advisors and President of Baird Funds. Mary Ellen is responsible for over 120 billion assets under management. She previously served as President and CEO of First Star Investment Research and Management Company. Mary Ellen has served on numerous boards, including Baird Financial Group, Northwestern Mutual, and Marquette University. Yay. In 2019, 2020, and 2021, Mary Ellen was a finalist for Morningstar's Outstanding Portfolio Manager Award. Under her leadership, the Baird Advisors team was also named a finalist for the Morningstar Inc.'s 2016 Fixed Income Fund Manager of the Year Award. In 2020 and 2021, she was named to Barron's List of the 100 Most Influential Women in U.S. Finance. Joining us today to moderate a fireside chat with Mary Ellen is Marie Winters, Senior Vice President for Northern Trust Asset Management and a past chair of CFA Society Chicago. Marie also oversees sustainable investing initiatives for Northern's fixed income group globally. Previously, she was at J.P. Morgan Chase, where she served as a leader and participant in new department initiatives, including high yield securities, distressed investing, and M&A due diligence. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to the fireside chat, Mary Ellen and Marie. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, it's so great to see all of you. These are really precious moments uh, just to reconnect with uh, people. Thank you for coming, especially in such a dreary morning. And Mary Ellen, what a treat to have you join us today. Thank so, you. and it's so wonderful to see you again. Thank so you. thank you so much. So, so this particular event is hosted by the women's group at the CFA Society. And of course, we love to talk about markets, but we also enjoy talking about careers and how we can help women. And so starting with that, we would really enjoy hearing what got you into the investment management business? Well, I would say it was largely uh, financial services and particularly banking um, that drew me in and then found particularly the trust and investment management side first. Um, my father was a community banker, actually McHenry State Bank, so grew up in McHenry. And we'd work in my dad's bank our summers and you know Christmas breaks in, in college, late high school and college. And so I saw firsthand you know, the, uh, the window through a community bank of um, what financial services was like. And so uh, when the opportunity came up with then First Wisconsin Trust Company, I'll show you how um, experienced, I was gonna say how old I am, but experienced, they had created an entry level job for, they were just launching money market funds. Money market funds didn't exist. And so in April of 1979, they were creating money market funds for the trust business and they needed somebody to run them, and there was nobody with experience, so you know it was a great chance for somebody to get in on the ground floor. And certainly, you know, having the bank experience, having good grades, having just a, a willingness to do anything, which is part of the culture of how I grew up in Dad's bank, um, gave me an opportunity and a shot. And so that's how I got in. So I wouldn't say it was a master game plan going through school. My undergraduate degree is political science. I thought I was gonna go to law school and then my junior year woke up one day and thought, I don't wanna do that. So called home and said, you know, I think I, I'm gonna make a switch to business and typical. Um, my dad said, okay, here's your mother. And my mom said, oh, honey, God's got a plan. This will all work out. And, you know, I ended up taking a whole bunch of business courses and ended up getting a 
minor in business, and that certainly helped get me some kind of platform to work from off of there and eventually to get an MBA and all of that and a CFA and all of that. But I look back on it, and some of it was a little bit of preparation, and some of it was just wonderful luck to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, interesting. So, so you mentioned, and Chris mentioned, that you had been uh, listed for each of the last two years on Barron's 100 Most uh, Influential Women in U.S. Finance. And uh, this, last, this year, last spring, you said that your father had been a real inspiration to you. Can you share with us some of the, the lessons you learned from him that have really helped you across your career? Well, it, it's a great question because I would say those who knew both of my parents would say I'm a blend. Um, certainly professionally, who I am and how I'm wired and how I try to show up every day, I'm definitely my father's daughter. Um, the people skills and people side are more in my mother, but um, my dad, um, had extremely high expectations and um, held everyone, most of all himself, to those high expectations, but coupled it with this incredible commitment to customers and clients. And of course, being the third of, of six children, we were, when we had these summer jobs, we were to do anything and everything that needed to be done. And I was trying to remember this woman's name, it came to me, it was Lois. Lois, the switchboard operator, <laughs> was going on a two-week vacation, and nobody wanted to take Lois's job because Lois had this very central location right outside my dad's office and by the lenders, and she had what seemed to be 20 lines, you know, coming in to the bank, and she was also the receptionist. And so my dad had the idea that I would take Lois's job for two weeks. And when I look back on it, you know, I was probably 20 years old at the time, and the insight that I gained in terms of just, you know, being overwhelmed but going, dug on it, I gotta figure this out. You know, there's no turning back. Um, and everybody mattered to my dad, whether it was the tellers on the line, to the cleaning crew, to you know, some of the biggest business owners in town. And I watched firsthand how he worked all of that and would you know, effectively usher other people to other lenders or whatever. And I just got great insight that I, again, did not value or recognize at the time, but juggling a lot of balls, that commitment to customers, and that focus, and that leadership models the behavior that they want to see really for the organization. We didn't call it culture back then, but it was the culture that he and others were creating and he certainly modeled. So, you know, so, so many of the lessons today, some of my Barrett Advisors colleagues are here. You know, I learned back then just literally watching how he showed up and how he encouraged others to behave. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing that with us. So you've often said that the investment management industry is a great opportunity for women. Uh, results are objective, so it creates a very level playing field. Uh, and yet we can look at the percentages and I think we'd all like to see more diversity, um, including more women. So what do we need to do to attract more women? And, what do you see as some of the key hurdles? Um, and what can we do to, to help move that forward? So I think there are a number of things, and you're right. I have often said it's, it's, it's a great career. Um, it can be really intimidating in so many respects because it is objectively measured. Every day we get a report card. Uh, every day our mutual funds are valued and our performance scorecard goes up. And some days we, you know, and months and years we look really smart and other times, you know, not as much. You can get exogenous events that create havoc and you're trying to sort through all of that. So you gotta be able to figure out how to stay grounded through it all, but still the results are very objectively measured. So in my own case, 
Um, my boss, so I was started the money market funds and then money market fund activities in the morning every day. So it left the afternoons wide open. And I did a number of things, but there were two research projects that the then CIO uh, had, had up for grabs. One was researching the concept of duration and the practical uses thereof. And the other was the use of future and options in the management bond portfolios. I took the duration project Gary Alfie, who was eventually our research director, did the future and options one. And duration is today very mainstream. Obviously, in the man as you know, on the management of bond portfolios. Back then, it wasn't. It lived in actuarial science. And um, so I had this wonderful opportunity to you know, explore and be at the ground floor, really part of the pioneers who started rolling out not just research papers saying that it, it belonged mainstream because the backdrop also was at a time when interest rates suddenly went very high and very volatile. And there was this proliferation of all these new types of securities. And so using maturity to describe the bond portfolio, a bond's risk or bond portfolio's risk in the case of average maturity was limiting. You needed a better, more precise measure, which obviously duration and multi-factor duration models do a much better job of. So we were right at the right place at the right time with this concept and then started rolling out an asset liability product for our pension clients to fund their retired lives liability streams. We had pretty good success in the very early 80s doing that. And my boss, that CIO, was recruited to go to New York to create the business for Chase. And I had just turned 27. Um, fortunately, that same boss had said to me, go get a CFA, go work on your MBA. I said, which one first? He said, both of them at the same time, which was, in hindsight, really helpful because I was finishing my CFA up at the time this opportunity came up and was you know, one year away from the MBA at night. And so it was a chance to to take the top job and, and start building it out. And, um, and so I, I tell that story because I remember vividly thinking, I'm not ready, but I am ready. I've got more experience than anybody else using the concept of duration. And you go back through and all that you know, self-doubt, that, that, those voices. Um, so one of the things we need to do with everybody, particularly talent, women, client uh, associates of color, people who don't come from traditional backgrounds, is help with that, yes, you can do this. And here, here's how. And I, I am a big believer in, in order to be it, you've got to see it. And so getting more female role models and more role models of color also help a lot. So the kinds of things we need to do are pathways, right? You know, exactly what you're doing here to have more role, visible role models, support mentoring programs, support, you know, some of the national efforts. We just, you know, for the, we were supposed to have a Girls Who Invest intern two years ago and then um, had to put it on hold, had one last summer and she's coming back next summer and wants to support that program. We, we use very extensively college internship and now high school internships with Crystal Ray and some of the other pathways. And I mention all of that because you start showing the possibilities. And so many people you know, would not know to describe what you do, Marie, or what I do as potential career paths. But to say to a young woman, you know what, you are really good in math. And do you know you could do this, you could do that, you could be CFO of Baird someday. Our CFO is sitting right up here. So, but I mean, there's endless possibilities, but that young woman may not have any idea what paths are open potentially and all that she might think about is, and not that there's anything wrong with being a math teacher, because we need great math teachers. But um, I, I mention all of that because, you know, it's on all of us, you know, not just women, but men to continue to open up those pipelines and show people the possibilities. And there's so many, so many avenues where you can do that. And then the final thing I would say is get in there yourself and understand it. Because as we work with some of these kids, you know, I, I just said to my colleagues yesterday, what could be insurmountable challenges for those kids 
is nothing for us to address and fix. You know, and sometimes it's a scheduling issue, sometimes it's balancing family income levels to meet certain, you know, aid requirements. I mean, it can be, it can be the, something that we could take care of in an hour that could be the tipping point that has them tip the wrong way and potentially, you know, drop out or change their, their direction. So there's so many things and, and, you know, this is just a great career because I look back on the 40 plus years, I've led a really balanced life. Some would say, you know, how balanced is it, Mary Ellen, if you got up at 3.15 this morning to be here? Um, it's just an, a, a joke, I'm an early morning person, but we have three grown children, four grandchildren, I've been very involved in the community, and um, it's, it's just been a great, great, great career, and I wanna, be an advocate to open it up to, to more people. You have to work hard. You have to be very focused. You have to, you know, give it all you got, all of that, all of those attributes. You know, we still have to, our North stories, we still have to perform for our investors, but there's a lot of, lot of possibilities in terms of great careers for, for women. Mm, that's very well said. And Girls Who Invest is a great organization. Isn't it a great so, program? They really draw very widely, which is which is wonderful to see. So it they get is. those poli sci majors. I know, <laughs> I know, who just got lucky, right? And now, in fact, Dina was ours from Emory University. And, you know, Dina now is pathing to potentially a, a career. She's coming back next summer with us and just did wonderful work. Wow. And, did great work. We had six interns, and all six we issued offers to it by the end of July. They, they did so well, and they did really well together, which was also an interesting thing, the power of the cohort, you know, in terms of developing that teamwork at a very young age. Fabulous. So let's move over to talking about the, the markets and the macroeconomic environment. So certainly one of the topics that is top of mind for many investors right now is inflation. And is it transitory or is it persistent? So how do you think about uh, inflation and what are you watching in the markets? Well, it's, it's a great question. It's probably one of the questions. And certainly in case you didn't hear one of you know, the big flashing stories, the COLA, for Social Security oh. payments is 5.9% for the next year. I mean, wow, biggest increase in 40 years. So so um, I think I was gonna be a little um, sarcastic with you, but not really. Some <laughs> of it is transitory and some of it may be, there's more permanence to it. And the key is how much is in each camp and what's in each camp. And so the kinds of things that we're watching, so, so backing up, you know, none of us, experience matters, we always say that experience matters, um, because it allows you to potentially recognize certain patterns that you've potentially seen before in your career. Every cycle gives you something different you've never seen before, or it's, it, it masks a little differently. This cycle, none of us had, thank goodness, the pandemic in our playbook. None of us ever envisioned a forced economic shutdown. None of us envisioned quickly trying to take workforce remote. Um, none of us you know, would have envisioned in all of that, you'd also have this highly charged uh, environment both politically as well as with the social unrest. So when you think about what everyone has had to endure, it's been a really, really um, remarkable time period. In all of that, and the forced economic shutdown had certain, you, you were forced to do some things quickly, right? What we all didn't think about was the restart. There was debate about how fast will the restart be, right? Will it be a V, will it be, you know, what will it be? What letter of the alphabet? What we should have spent more time thinking about, I think, is where were the dislocations gonna be? And so today you can't, 
listen to a news, a business news report, or pick up a, a newspaper and not hear something about supply chain disruptions. Well, again, we cut everything off, and then we tried to restart it. Meanwhile, economically rational individuals and businesses and entities all made decisions to cut, you know, cut people, cut production, cut some of it was again in the, in the name of public health. But in other cases, it was you didn't know how bad this was going to be and how long it would go. So you just started cutting expenses, right? Because you, you wanted to survive and stay on your feet, preserve cash flow, you know, all of it. And in doing all of that, we planted seeds for some of this disruption. The other piece that's a little tricky to figure, in fact, very tricky to figure out, is what's truly happening with the labor markets because we're still almost um, 5 million jobs, something like that, still behind mm -hmm. where we were, you know, pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, some of those are, are not coming back, and some of those are not coming back by choice. So you've seen premature retirements, you've seen disproportionately women um, leave the workforce. Some of it is they're trying to balance children, daycares, our school's gonna stay safely in place whether young kids are not vaccinated. Hopefully, vaccinations will be approved for kids later this month or early next. Um, you have all sorts of issues with their elder care, right? For so many women in the workforce, you know, they, they were the ham in the ham sandwich, or are the ham in the ham sandwich, where they're dealing with young children or helping with grandchildren, and then you're also caring um, and responsible for aging parents. And so it, it, you're thinking about what does this my new commitment look like to my job? Um, and so I think people are trying to sort through that. And it's not just about income. And so as employers trying to figure out how, what are those balance? So we're, we're seeing things like job openings are huge, right? Something like 10 million available jobs. Quits are like skyrocketing too. And our sense is there's more going on there than just a robust labor market where price, you know, the price of labor is labor's rising. So I mentioned all of that because to your question about transitory, some of that is um, acerbated by the time period and the tightness in the reopening, probably and certainly in certain types of commodities, certain goods, certain services, and also in the labor markets. With time, some of that will sort itself out. Now, the things that we watch and think about, what are the things that start driving expectations? What are the things that are really hard to roll back, right? So hard to roll back when rental increases, right? They, they start moving, and generally they don't go back the other way. They, they start, they get pretty sticky. Um, wages tend to be pretty sticky too, but it's been interesting to watch employers, what they're doing. They're not necessarily dramatically changing their comp structures. They're doing signing bonus. They're doing all sorts of things to attract in the labor they need, but not upset their current structure yet. But let's take a look at, you know, longer term, how all of that goes. Some of the early, like, rocket ride, big, huge price increases, autos, travel-related, uh, rental cars, you know, those prices went up, shooting way up, and now are rolling over and starting to come back down. So it's, it's indicating that, you know, the supply chain is starting to work. So, so those are the kinds of things, ask yourself, how much you know, is, is being truly embedded into the wage structure and the price structure? And I think the Fed, and you know, we take them, we look closely at minutes and you know, speeches and all of that, they believe most of it is transitory, although there's pretty good debate now when you look at the last minutes, the set of minutes, which is good that they should be debating and a little more concerned about some of this. Um, the more troublesome thing would be that the Fed was totally ignoring mm. this argument. Um, 
But, you know, the bottom line is the transition period might not be in months, three, six, nine months. It might be more like a year or two. And um, so those are the kinds of things. So does the Fed have to accept that you'll run higher in inflation rates over the near term, but that it'll settle back down? And, and I think that's right now where they're, where they're leaning. But, you know, stay attuned. And there's nothing like watching it yourself as a consumer or watching it as a business person. You know, can you attract the talent? You know, when you go to make an offer, is it being accepted at what you think is a, a fair, you know, competitive package? Do you need to put some sweeteners in? For, for associates who want more flexibility, you know, is there a trade-off with comp? you know, or benefits somehow. So those are the kinds of things, Marie, mm -hmm. that I think you look at. And um, particularly on the lower end of the wage bands, it will be healthier to have some wage and real income growth be to more um, family sustaining income levels. That will be good overall for the economy. So lots to watch. Certainly we could go on and on because it's for every example you've got on the one side, you could go, yeah, but I'm a little concerned and go to any major city where there's a port and you see the tankers and you see the cargo ships. Um, you see them lined up and they're trying to figure out and Politically, I think the administration, one of my colleagues said to me this morning, you know, it's not good politically if there aren't going to be Christmas gifts available because they're sitting on a tanker somewhere. And so trying to get that cargo delivered, you know, off, first of all, off the ships and then delivered um, is, a, is a, certainly a good thing. But getting it back, really, the supply chain working again. Well, thank you. So it's hard to believe, but 40 years ago this summer, former Fed Chair Paul Volcker raised the uh, Fed funds rate to 20%. I know, it's pretty amazing, yes? So, and since then, of course, we've had this incredible bull market in bonds. So given where we are today, and rates are still near uh, their historical lows, how do you see the role of fixed income evolving going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, and a comment for the younger people. So um, we were dubbed, our, Gary and I were dubbed the bear market babies when Paul Boker was doing that because we were really <laughs> early in our career and all the experienced people around us were going, oh my gosh, this has to happen, this has to happen. We'd be like, well, why, why can't Paul Boker take short rates to 20%? Is what they were trying to do was absolutely wring out inflation expectations and just try to bring effectively that set of expectations to its knees, but particularly the economy as well, and, and shock the system. Um, and so you're right, it unleashed this period where rates went up, they went high. Now we would push back a little bit because when you look at the chart, it looks like you go up and then you come back down. The last 40 years have not been a straight line, as you know, a straight that's, line that's down. That's fair enough. <laughs> there, there has been plenty of volatility that you and I have had to manage through with our, with our, our colleagues. But so you ask a really great question. What is the role of fixed income? And with nominal rates and yields lower and spreads fairly tight, there still is an important role for fixed income. Um, and it, uh, it's more about lowering overall volatility for the investor, providing liquidity for the investor, and really being that anchor. And there are points in every cycle and this cycle probably we've been pushed to more extreme levels because of the pandemic and because of all the extraordinary um, programs from the Fed and central banks throughout the world. There's been so much liquidity interjected into the system that in some ways you've probably distorted market valuations. And, and in that case, you know, yields are a reflection of that. So what we hear from investors of all sorts is, 
Most don't have the 60-40 anymore. In fact, most institutional investors are near some of the lowest levels in core fixed income that we've seen on our career. But what they say to us is they want to make sure what they have truly stands up and behaves like the asset class um, from a fixed income vantage point, the properties people seek in fixed income, predictability, consistency, um, liquidity, um, those properties, they don't want their fixed income to be amplifying equity-like risk because that never appears or doesn't, isn't real obvious to people until you get those, those periods where things are very volatile and very dislocated. And so that's the role of fixed income. It's really to, to be that counterbalance, if you will, in all of it. And you know, our, our execution or our, our approach to it all is wanting to make sure that what we do when the products that we have for our investor base, whether it's across the municipal lineup or the taxable lineup, that we um, exhibit the properties and perform like our investors would expect. And unfortunately, we've had plenty of episodes where people can go back and go, yep, March, April of 2020, how did you do? What, did you, what happened? And if in that period you had stretched and taken on um, risks that are more equity-like, maybe masquerading in fixed income conduits, you're, you were far more volatile in terms of your performance. And so those are the kinds of things. So I think it's really important for fixed income investors, first, what's your objective? What are you trying to do? How much liquidity could you need? And that's your store, your mattress money, if you will, one, one um, client probably now about 15 years ago, he, he called us his sleep insurance and thought we would be terribly offended. And I said, that's a badge of honor. We, we should be your sleep insurance. Um, and so I think that's the role of fixed income. But the final, final thing is we're in an environment where expected returns going forward are going to be lower equity and fixed. So for that balanced investor, whatever their balance is, you know, we have probably, because of all this liquidity injected into the markets, we've probably pulled forward some performance and some returns. And so for investors, our sense is you're not being paid to take significant risk. Um, certainly there's opportunities, but they need to be appropriately managed and sized. And uh, there will be a better day, because uh, there will be something, some spark, right? It's always hard to predict what it is that will cause spreads to widen volatility and rates to get more volatile. And so, so I think that's you know, how we size it up. With aging populations, and this is another thing that people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but I'm sure you see it at Northern Trust. Wow, it's not just in the United States. It is throughout the world. We have aging populations. Aging populations save and invest differently. And we see it all the time that people are continuing. You get any kind of move up in rates, it just draws more money into bonds. Bond inflows right now in bond funds and ETFs, record levels in the last couple of years have been record levels, and we've already exceeded that for the first nine months of the year. So our sense is, as rates, if they do start marching up, you know, there's this counter where you see at the margin, investors continuing to put more money into bonds. So key for investors to understand the risk Cost to invest, watch that really carefully because with low interest rates, low nominal rates, you know, how much you're paying somebody or how much you're paying in transaction costs and ultimately if you're in a taxable account, taxes, those enemies of wealth eat up a lot of the, the potential return. So th thinking about, you know, rates being, nominal rates being really low, 
um, and investors really desiring return. We've certainly seen a lot of growth more recently in the private credit markets. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we've seen a big run in the private equity markets, but it seems in more recent years, the private debt markets have really taken off. How, what do you think about that? Is that an attractive opportunity for fixed income investors to consider? Do you think the market's getting a bit frothy? Um, um, for some investors, I think it's hard for individuals. Again, if, if your reason for owning fixed income is to lower overall volatility and to have that store of liquidity to be able to tap, and again, if, if you need to pay you know, taxes or you need to pay college tuition or you need all, all of life's needs, right? Or an institutional investor, if you're a health system and you're building, you know, a new, a new building somewhere, you, you need access to that capital. So um, in the private debt markets, you give up a lot of liquidity. And um, so you need to think about that. And then much like in the private space, private equity space, there's an awful lot of money flowing in there. So is, is it being appropriately valued and sized? That said, there are opportunities, but generally for sophisticated institutional investors, and again, our sense is there's an awful lot of money that has flowed there, um, and uh, uh, you just need to go in all eyes, op eyes open. And then again, that final point, always ask yourself, um, when you're when you're straying a little bit straying sounds judgmental I don't mean it to, to be judgmental but as you start moving away from kind of the center balance um, think about all right what am I giving up in liquidity am I being paid to take that risk and are there some underlying risks lurking in there that will flash and become more equity like you know high yield um, below investment grade kinds of credits. Perfect example, you look at those entities' balance sheets, you might be the high yield bondholder, the leverage loan. Um, you, there's not a lot of equity there. So you, you are effectively gonna mm -hmm. behave more equity-like into the extremes. And so just, just know that, right? And be ready for that and always think about that because um, when the day comes that you need access to those assets, if you do, um, you don't want it to be at a point in time where somebody says, you know what, we're going to have to gate you. We'll, we'll be back in six months or whatever. And that's, you know, the, one of your, your pockets that you were hoping to use for liquidity to pay bills. Maybe rebalance your portfolio and take advantage of you know, extreme dislocation. So again, I, you know, there's, there's some opportunities, but whenever things get a little more crowded, you get a little more concerned about, I think, the value and whether you're being paid. Well, thank you. So I want to give some time for questions from the audience. So uh, due to COVID, we are not taking um, live questions from the audience here but we did receive some questions ahead of time. So I'm gonna go through those with you, Mary Ellen. Okay. Um, but we also have a number of participants that are listening in virtually. So uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please enter those and uh, they'll get those questions up to us uh, for Mary Ellen to address. So. So I'll start with uh, some questions we got ahead of time. This one is from Katrina. Uh, can you please give advice to women on how to get onto private board seats? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, think about your value proposition and think about um, what, what your area of expertise is and what your value is going to be uh, to that entity. So um, areas you know, right now, certainly there's always interest in, you know, financial experts or for the financial expertise is one. Um, certainly uh, executive compensation is an area that, you know, I don't think a lot of women think about if they have um, a sophisticated, knowledgeable background about uh, how to design and um, particularly monitor and incent 
the executive compensation plans. Um, but the people side and the culture is certainly an important one. So you know, that, that would be one. ESG is increasingly a topic that is happening in, you know, everywhere, but including boardrooms. Um, certainly technologists are really important, and particularly cyber risk, but also the question about are we spending the right amount? You know, where are we on, on that curve? Um, and you're not there as management, but you're there to ask good questions and offer insights. So the, the couple of board, I'm on our own Baird Financial Group board, and I like to think, um, add value there and know that business. But the two corporate boards that I, I've sat on, I sit on Northwestern Mutual, big life insurance companies are just big investment portfolios. Wrapped with, now they would say, you know, there's more than just, <laughs> just the investment side, but they're wrapped with insurance products and wealth products. But at the core is this big, huge investment portfolio. So um, needless to say, having, and it's disproportionately bonds and fixed income. So um, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And my other one is uh, WEC. Um, which is the largest utility in the state of Wisconsin. So a highly regulated business. And uh, both of those are the two that I've served on. And that's, that's been an interesting one too, in terms of footprint, highly, both highly, highly uh, regarded companies and, and top performers and recognized in their industries. So um, there it's as much about the regulatory footprint, the economic development behind the footprint. Certainly, WEC also owns People's Gas, so big Chicago part of the franchise, too, uh, after they acquired Integris many years ago, or we, we acquired Integris. So those are the two, and I would say, you know, I always encourage people to think about those board opportunities, whether they be the corporate or community, because I do always feel like um, I'm better at what I do because of those experiences. Uh, and I can be a contributor, but I also get a lens um, into how other people are thinking about things and doing things. The challenge is managing, as, as uh, the CEO of a, a Milwaukee company, a public company, said to me right after he became CEO, one of his directors gave him advice and and he said you know Blake it's it's as much about people think it's about managing your calendar which is true you, you've got that but it's managing your energy and so how you can allocate your time your um, purpose to a number of different things and entities and that so I encourage people to do it because I think that outside in perspective hugely valuable hugely valuable. And I also feel like, you know, I, I tend to try to be a servant leader and I do feel like I'm contributing um, something back. So Baird is one of the original signers to the UN's uh, PRI, PRI, Principles mm -hmm. for Responsible Investment. So another question we have from Katrina is, what is, is Baird doing on the ESG front? You know, and, and uh, Emily Hahn from Aon covers us, so we've had many, many conversations about this, but as, you know, as, as she knows, um, we take the view as bondholders, we're long-term lenders. So sustainability and all the core pillars and tenants have been integrated into our decision-making for a very, very long time. What I don't think we've done uh, as good a job as we now are doing is articulating that to our investors. Um, certainly Baird as a company scores very, very high uh, in terms of a culture, best place to work, great to our communities, very responsible corporate citizen, always wanting to get better, conscious on impact on climate, you know, all of it. We would tend to score very high, which helps a lot because who we work for in the parent company matters a lot. 
and then how we translate. So we felt strongly, and the Baird Funds did become a signatory, because we felt we needed and wanted to signal to our investors the importance of the topic. So what we have found most helpful, we've added some additional resources, but what we are finding most helpful recently, and we just did this on our quarterly investor call the other day, is we showed a couple of examples of core bond portfolio positions um, and names that we own. One was a taxable credit and now the other one was KIPP, a charter school system on the Muni side. And our analysts walk through the why and trying to get in our heads about how those decisions are made and the why behind how we analyze a sector, or in that case, a, a credit. So um, more to come on that, because I think it's really important, that articulation. Um, and then the, you know, the advocacy and the importance that we are active bondholders, but we are bondholders. We're not equity holders. And so that is different in terms of how much you are able to do. But certainly, you know, many years ago, we dropped out of a structured deal because there was, or didn't completely drop out, cut back significantly. There was reported some, frankly, bad behavior on the part of executives with regard to how they were treating women and a number of other things. And we called the underwriter and, you know, Meg Dean, who's one of our co-leads on the structured side, of the, um, you know, said, listen, we are cutting back what, you know, what we've asked for and here's why. And we wanted to send the strong message that, you know, culture matters. And we're not just in there as a bondholder um, looking for the additional yield and the additional alpha that, you know, if we aren't comfortable with the who, chances are there's other things we aren't going to be comfortable with. So it's a topic that is one we, we talk a lot about. And I would say, Marie, want to just continue. I know you're doing great work at, at Northern Trust. Just continuing to you know, articulate from, from the why and then the integration and how it comes alive in our portfolios for our investors. More to come. So related to that, we have a question from Theodore and he references your serving on the board of the utility company, WEC, okay. um, and wants to know how that has impacted your views on ESG investing and the environment in particular. Well, certainly it's been very helpful. And WEC has been a top performing utility, you know, from a shareholder vantage point but also um, highly responsible as a corporate citizen, but also continuing to overachieve on their goals for you know, carbon reduction. And so it's um, seeing it firsthand um, and being in the boardroom and hearing the discussions and, and the why, you know, it's playing out. It's an interesting topic because um, not, this isn't a WEC related comment, but right now in Europe, Kind of playing out, right? Europe had this big push to, you know, to green and clean, and suddenly natural gas prices are you know, volatile and going through the roof. And this is one of the issues with regard to the utilities in general. That yes, this is all very, very desirable, but you can go through these periods of time where it's very destabilizing. And so we're in an environment where suddenly economic growth is rising dramatically. Demand for energy is going up quickly, dramatically. At the same time, there have been, some would say, disincentives for big capital, pro traditional capital investment into the sector. And so you get the squeeze, right? And the way the market clears is on price. And of course, our friend Putin in Russia, you know, wants to help. Um, and that's, you know, fraught with lots of challenges. So I think it's like anything in life. I feel like the older I get, the more I sound like my mother. But, you know, it's all about balance and the grids, you know, it's, it, whether it's WEC or any other utility, they talk about the fleet and the mix of, of their energy base and the different sources and how you source that and particularly how you sequence it. 
over time. And while we all wish for dramatic reductions immediately, our demand for energy still remains very robust. And so can the market absorb that? And the way it absorbs it is you know, higher prices. And again, what's our, what's our willingness? What's our willingness to bear that? So complicated question, but to, to Theodore, <laughs> Absolutely, because I've been able to hear the discussion on the other side, you know, from the company, from the utilities vantage point, and, and how they continue to march towards their goals and actually exceed them. It's an extremely well-run utility. This isn't a commercial, but extremely well-run utility. Um, and so it, it's just helped highlight the issues for mm -hmm. me. So one other question uh, that had come in ahead of time, this one from Casey. In your experience, what were the essential tools to become a successful chief investment officer? And how do you see that toolbox changing in the future? Great question, Casey. Um, so just two days ago, we named a co-chief investment officer, my long or our long-standing deputy CIO, Warren Pearson, and I are now co-CIOs, and that's been part of our, you know, years-long um, succession planning. We've got a view that none of these transitions, the industry has not done this well. Now I'll get in my soapbox. You know, we built star systems and it becomes episodic where, oh my gosh, suddenly somebody's, you know, gotten into a fight with their partners over comp or, you know, whatever power. And then suddenly the, the you know, the clients are like, what just happened there? There's this huge change in personnel. And it should be just the opposite. It should be evolutionary, not revolutionary. And I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I often um, want to remember who we're there to serve. So we are in, our core product is in um, a 401k lineup. We're in a lot of lineups, but for a grocery chain in the Southeast. And when I stand at the deli counter, every time I'm in Florida and order my turkey, I think to myself, I wonder if he or she owns the aggregate bond fund in their, in their retirement plan. And I do that because I just I take that responsibility to heart. Um, it's, it's such an important responsibility. And I don't want someday that their plan sponsor has to go, oh, no, there's been some, you know, we didn't expect that change at Baird. And so we got to go do a search and look for another, you know. And so we talk a lot about team. So, and maybe it's because I became the leader of the pack back, you know, when I was young. I've always had a very participative style. Um, we always say to our investors and those who recommend us, if you wandered in unannounced into our offices, you wouldn't know who's who in the zoo by the way we work. You might by our ages or where our primary workstations are, but across the team, across generations, age-wise, experience levels. And so that participative style has been really key, really key, because um, we've got a lot of experience together, which is great. It's been a core strength, but we've got a lot of great newer talent, younger talent. And we always think about how do we give them voice? Because when we give them voice, you know, they have a perspective. Charlie Grosso, one of the other founders, always says, everybody wants a chance to drive the golf cart. And we always chuckle when he says it. But we know what he means, that everybody wants a chance to contribute. And so, and what, what the younger talent does for us is there's an energy, their technology skills are incredible compared to mine. Um, but they also have a fresh perspective. They're kind of like I was and Gary was when we were beer market babies when Paul Volcker changed the game. And so there's this perspective and this freshness that is really healthy. And so that, when I look back on it, you know, still remains really, really important. I would say, and I'm wired, I, I went to, came up to Marquette to go to Marquette, or went to Milwaukee to go to Marquette and the Jesuit education is, 
all about servant leadership. And so I'm wired like that. And so I try to really show up and be unselfish and model, much like my dad did, model the behavior that I really want to see. And our North Star always is what are we there to do and who are we there to serve? And it's all about our investors. We say every day we come to win for our investors. When we do that, the Baird shareholders do well because the business generates high returns on invested capital. And our incentives, every single one of us, from you know our receptionists to the top investment talent, we're all, our bonuses are determined by how we did for investors. So we love that elegant alignment and simplicity. Nobody's paid to grow the business. We don't have the credit team incented based on how their picks do versus the structure, because we want everybody to see the whole field and how we define the game is winning for that investor. And so we want our, we want our credit analysts to say, hey, right now, these spreads are too tight on the short end. You know, I think we're better off owning you know, some short ABS at these levels, or our taxable muni folks go, we think this is particularly attractive for our shorter portfolios. And it's that interaction and breaking down the silos, because risk lives in between those sectors, and opportunity often is missed if you're too siloed. So those are the kinds of things that I, you know, I think has been a big differentiator on um, who we are. Certainly, we're, we've got a player coach model, and um, Warren is as good a player coach as any on our, our um, team. And we're incredibly transparent with our investors. We have been for, in fact, when we, when we were announcing it, several investors said, you know, that's about as well telegraphed a succession <laughs> move as any we've ever seen. And, you know, there's, we weren't announcing my retirement or any specific change other than the team has never been stronger and the bench has never been more significant and all there to serve the investors. So Marie, we have an a online question from one of our uh, webcast viewers. Um, Mary, and Helen, Mary Ellen, how has your use of data analytics technology changed in recent years, and what do you expect looking forward? So my um, view on data and analytics and technology, huge, 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 and the tools continue to amaze. However, and this is one of, you know, again, my age, and I sound like people's mother, now grandmother, um, age-wise, but it's the art and the science of what we do. The technology and the data and the tools organize the information. They're great to help us report how we're doing. We're able to very quickly know exactly where our exposures are, or if we have big flows one way or another, being able to you know, calibrate and know. So all of that is incredibly valuable from a decision-making vantage point, and be able to keep everybody on the same page. We're not doing on the back of an envelope, you know, I think the iterations move in a tenth of a year, two tons. So all that is fabulous. The downside is an over-dependency on those tools. So what do I mean by that? Again, my, my beloved father would always say, Catherine, these kids all brains and no common sense. So I grew up hearing that like all the time. And I think to myself, what does he mean by that? And then I realized, you know, he was trying to get us to see the why and not just, you know, solving for the answer, but how, show your work. How did, and the why. And in the why, for the folks who are such masters of our data and our technology, in the why helps them inform from the judgment vantage point. And so that's the part, it's that, you know, it's that balance of those two. And yes, every release and every new tool, I'm just amazed at, you know, the wonder, and they have to, you know, help, help do little teach-ins to help, help some of us with those tools, but we can help them the other way around. And, you know, and then our, our client-facing portfolio managers, who've got a couple of them here, and those who, you know, these tools are wonderful because any seat you're in at Baird Funds and Baird Advisors, 
you can have a pretty good look at where we are and how we're positioned. And then we try to, those of us who are a little more on the front lines, try to articulate that so that our investor base can understand. We try to be really transparent with our investors and use that information and data decision-making and then communicating with them. Well, we're just about at time. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Or rebuttals. <laughs> so let's just end with, um, you know, if you were looking back at your 30-year-old self, what advice would you share with that young professional? Yeah, so our 30-year-olds, Warren Pearson always says, our 30-year-olds are amazing. They're so much smarter and better than I will. You know, he'll say that, and I'm like, well, you were pretty good at 30, okay? Uh, just for the record. But, but so I would say, you know, at 30, I mean, I, kind of where I started, there are those little voices for all of us, right? And that you're, you're too young. You're, you're, you're not experienced enough. You're not... And I would say go for it because opportunities don't always show up when you're perfectly ready for it. And sometimes they're packaged up in ways. I remember when Dean told me he left, I cried. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not ready for you to go. And you look back at it and if he had stayed another 10 years, who knows if I would have gotten the shot I got. And so go for it. And um, you know, and develop that strong sense of self that, you know, that grounds you. What matters to you most? And how are you going to be able to get up every day and do this and define for yourself what success looks like? And then go for it and live life to the fullest. You're so blessed and don't take any, any day for granted. Great advice. So, well, this has been very special, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Marie. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity.